Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Madeline Fitzgerald, and I am the manager of adult programs here at the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art. Thank you all for joining us this evening for our exhibition talk on Faces from the Interior, the North American Portraits of Carl Bodmer. Uh, on behalf of the museum, I would especially like to welcome and thank our members who are in the audience this evening. It is because of your generosity that our collection and special exhibitions are free and open to everyone. We would like to acknowledge that the Carter's presentation of Faces from the Interior is supported by the Alice L. Walton Foundation Temporary Exhibitions Endowment. Additionally, I would like to thank the TCC Sign Language Program for their partnership with the Carter. <laughs> These intern students and, uh, and faculty are an ongoing presence at talks and other public programs here at the Carter, and I am thrilled that you all are here to support our programs. Thank you. We'll begin tonight's talk with a brief introduction of the exhibition from Spencer Wigmore, who is the Carter's Associate Curator of Painting, Sculpture, and Works on Paper. Following Spencer's introduction of the exhibition, we'll then watch the short documentary film, Faces from the Interior, which features one of our speakers this evening, Dr. Jessa Ray Growing Thunder, uh, as well as her family. After the film, I'll come back on stage and introduce our two speakers before they begin their conversation. And now I would like to invite Spencer Wigmore to briefly talk about the exhibition, Faces from the Interior, the North American Portraits of Carl Bodmer. Thanks. Thanks everyone for coming out today. Um, I was, I'm so, grateful and appreciative for the opportunity to be um, a part of this exhibition, coordinating the Carter's presentation of this show, which was organized by my friend and colleague, Annika Johnson, the Associate Curator of Native American Art at Jocelyn Art Museum in Omaha, Nebraska. Faces from the Interior is really exciting to me because it's the first show to focus exclu exclusively on the unique portraiture of Swiss artist Karl Bodmer. Um, Bodmer was active in the mid 19th century and he was one of the first European artists that created a visual record of Native American leaders, lifeways, and homelands in the Plains region. And he was hired in the early 1830s by the German naturalist and prince Maximilian. And in 1833 and 34, he accompanied Maximilian on a journey up the Missouri River, a round trip expedition that would total more than 5,000 miles. And along the way, he created numerous watercolor portraits that record the lives of specific individuals along the river as well as their unique places within their own communities. And I said that this was the first show to focus exclusively on Bodmer's portraiture, but it's also really the first project that centers the relevance and meaning of these works in the present day. What really is compelling about this project and reflects the work of Jocelyn's curatorial team is the way that this project takes the story of Bodmer and Maximilian and shifts the focus off of the day-to-day -day itinerary of these two Europeans to understand this complex, international, multicultural world that they were visitors and guests in along their journey. And this expedition tells that story in a way that features and emphasizes the voices and perspectives of indigenous knowledge bearers, teachers, artists, historians, dancers, drummers, singers, who reflect on the place of Bodmer's imagery in their own lives and the meanings that they draw from that material. That's really the heart of this story. And the component that we're going to be talking about today 
um, consists of four short documentary films, portraits really in a different medium, film rather than watercolor. And these were commissioned specifically for this exhibition. And these projects really attend to the diverse beliefs, beliefs, practices, and histories that you'll find in these works when you go upstairs after this event to see the show. But it emphasizes how these elements are expressed through today, in the present day, through contemporary practitioners, including you know, the subject of tonight's event, Dr. Jessa Ray, Growing Thunder, and her family and that community that forms the Growing Thunder Collective. I was really fortunate to be part of this from an early stage, but this is actually the first time I've um, been able to meet Jessa Ray and two of the remarkable filmmakers who participated in this, Tessa Wedberg and John Hustad, who couldn't be here tonight. Um, we just had such great conversations over Zoom, exploring ideas, developing kind of concepts and things to really explore. And it was so great to watch in the midst of a pandemic, all of this come together in a really extraordinary way. And I think these films really speak for themselves. And so with that, I would just like to give it over to YouTube for a moment. And then um, Tessa and Jessa Ray, who can really talk in depth about why this um, story is so compelling. Let's see if I all tab right. Oh, I did it. Okay. My mom and my grandma, they, they can wake up at like two or three in the morning and they start working. And they'll work all day long until about dinner time. They'll eat dinner together and they'll go to sleep. Growing up with this, I thought this was totally normal. I was six years old and I went to my friend's house and for the life of me, I could not figure out why her mom wasn't beating. It was just this like pivotal moment in my life. I went home and I asked my mom, I was like, you know, why do you do this? And she said, we have to. We do these little things every single day, whether that's beating or quilling or dancing or singing or praying. We do these little things every day to make sure and guarantee that it survives so that your grandchildren will have it. And it's a responsibility that we all carry. Good day, my name is Jessa Ray Gorin Thunder. Um, I come from the Buffalo Nation. I am a third generation beadwork and quillwork artist. My name is Juanita Growing Thunder Fogarty, and I'm a Cinnaboyne Sioux from the Fort Peck Reservation in northeast corner of Montana. I um, am a beadworker because my mother was a beadworker. My name is uh, Joyce Growing Thunder Fogarty, and my Indian name is Two Buffalo Woman, Tatanka Nupawea. I've been beading for 50 some years now, seems like. I picked up my first needle and thread when I was three, um, just because this is this is natural. You know, I, I say I'm a third generation beadwork and quillwork artist, but really it's probably more like seven generations because my grandma learned from her grandmothers. We always tease around about, oh, you, you get bit by the bee bug. <laughs> the elders, they always acknowledge me because I was interested and they told me to be proud to be an Assiniboine. Be proud who you are. Can you imagine that they didn't even have needles and they would just use that and all? It take a long time. Yeah. <laughs> My grandma always talks about, she always says, it's a touch. And you know, that's why I don't tell Nuna no. These ones stay over here. You know, when she wants to be up here and touching and feeling things, I don't tell her no because she has to start to learn to touch so that she knows what her hands need to do.
we're using, um, you know, natural brain tan deer hides, and we're using hair and uh, moose hide and porcupine quills. My mom and my grandma have always taught me that. No matter what you're working on, you use the best materials because you put your best into every single piece. You put your heart and your soul into everything that you do. My mom has the best work ethic and can get to sit down and just knock something out. And it turns out perfect, you know? And it's like, I hope someday to be like that. Sometimes she doesn't even look. You know, it's a matter of her hands just instinctively know what to do. A lot of people don't have patience, so it takes a lot of patience. And you have to have the materials and the know-how and the, and the gumption to do it. You have to have the want to just be there. So the buckskin, you can smell it too. Smell the um, rain. Mm -hmm. Whenever I do get the chance to, to sit down and work face to face with them, there's something more cosmic happening when we're all together working on these things um, with one another. Because I know the knowledge that my mom carries, she got from my grandma, got from her grandmother, and I just feel really blessed to be, you know, the younger one sitting at the table, knowing that my daughter is going to be at the table soon with me. <laughs> If we're together, that's, you know, like magic for us. What we do is full of our love for our people, for our families. And that's how my mother showed she loved us. <laughs> Smile, you and Kenya. Was she made us things. We associate this work with love. I enjoy giving everything. I never keep anything for myself, hardly. <laughs> From the moment that I knew I was expecting, my color palette changed. My connection with my beads and my quills had changed. And when I look at a finished piece, I, I, I don't see the, the woman that I was before motherhood. It's a different feeling and a different connection with these knowledges. I don't even have to tell them much anymore. They seem to know more than me sometimes, or most of the time. <laughs> like Juanita, she's just a walking encyclopedia when it comes to Indian. You know, my mom is the best researcher I've ever come across because she spends the time with things. She does what she can to, to gain that knowledge of, of why things are done the way they are. That's what I appreciate about the, the Bodmer sketches and paintings and drawings, is the detail makes it easy on me because I can look and say, okay, well, this is what they use. Gives me a leg up because I can see, oh, they did it this way. Try to stick to the traditional colors from that time period and just try to make sure everything is historically accurate as I can get it. And that's important to me. I'm just proud of them. Yeah. They all know how to do, do what I do and do it better sometimes. I wanted to go to graduate school because I wanted to do more oral history work with my grandma. She grew up on the reservation during this beautiful time where she knew all of the old timers. She knew her great grandparents and, you know, she heard the language every day. She. She knew all of those knowledges firsthand. I want to document her perspective of what it means to be a Fort Peck, the Dakota, Dakota woman. Watch out for that bag. <laughs> she really knows how to speak on our behalf. She's become a real leader of our little family and our, the, our tribe. <laughs> I'm going to be the first doctor growing thinner. I won't be the last but I'm gonna be Dr. Growing Thunder um, because somebody's gotta do it. And so I was doing all this, this oral interviews with my grandma. You know, as I'm working through this process and I'm doing, working through transcripts and everything, I started to recognize like, well, the story that she's sharing, she's been this before. 
And I was able to look at back at specific, you know, pieces of her beadwork and be like, well, this is what she's doing. She's telling this history, even though she wasn't doing it with her voice, she was doing it with her hands. My grandparents, they'd all just love to dance and get ready and go sit at the powwow, go under the big top. It was a magic time for me. It really was a, there probably won't be another celebration like that. Yeah. It was just like, like heaven, being in heaven. <laughs> it's not just us sitting here either. It's, you know, we have my grandmas and grandmas and grandmas and grandmas that are here helping us. I'm recognizing that our women have always been historians. You know, if you look at the materials being used at any moment, the colors of the designs, those are the snip of that moment in history for us. These women are documenting our histories. And even though they're seemingly voiceless, they have spoken with precise articulation throughout colonization. And it's a matter of how we view history and how we view women, you know, as active agents of decolonization. If I'm not here tomorrow, I'm good because I get to do this every day. And it is so satisfying for me to be able to contribute to the preservation of my culture for my people and hopefully inspire younger people. It's about helping to preserve things for my culture and my people. And um, I'm just helping it along by doing my part. It's just like a comfort. I mean, like you, you talk to my grandma and you, you get to know my grandma and I think she is kind of the embodiment of that feeling because you can, you can see it on her. You know, when she's not beating, you can see that that's what she's thinking about. Like she misses her beads. The family is, is absolutely everything to us. Everything that we do is for the betterment of our family. It's never about us as an individual. Um, it's about you know, doing these things that are going to be good for all of us. I'm going to be carrying on this tradition when I'm not here. And they're going to be, um, I know they're going to do good. We got a little insight to our uh, one of our speakers this evening, but I'll introduce both of them. Um, Tessa Wedberg is an artist, writer, connector, and filmmaker who has worked on award-winning feature and short films, including Nebraska. While freelancing in the film world, she has also directed and produced documentary work, music videos, and commercial projects. She is a creative consultant and frequent collaborator with organizations, artists, and institutions, including Film Streams, the Jocelyn Art Museum, Refugee Empowerment Center, and many more. She recently collaborated on a performance in film with poet Ikran Hamza and uh, did a writer's residency in Iowa that is yielding a new body of work. 
She loves to travel, walk, explore, make photos, and find a wild awe in the simple details. She has many projects in process and development and loves the opportunity to connect and create with people from all over the world. She wrote in her bio that she is passionate about what grows when stories are shared, believes they are powerful vehicles for change, transformation, and understanding. And Dr. Jessa Ray Growing Thunder comes from the Fort Peck Assiniboine and Sioux tribes. She is a mother, a wife, daughter, granddaughter, sister, and aunt. Jessa Ray is a third generation beadwork and quill work artist whose work has been shown in multiple museums, including the Minneapolis Institute of Art, the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian, the Heard Museum, the Jocelyn Art Museum, and of course, here at the Amon Carter. Jessa Ray is a Great Plains tribal art historian. She holds a PhD in Native American Studies from the University of California, Davis. Her work applies both recognized archival and oral history and traditional creative forms of knowledge transmission through analyzing beadwork as living testimony. Jessa Ray is a 2022 Loose Indigenous Knowledge Fellow and is currently working on a project that promotes traditional materials used in quill work through community-based oral histories, land-based knowledge, and indigenous sciences. So after our two speakers come on stage and discuss their work on the film in connection with the faces from the interior exhibition, we'll transition into a Q&A with all of you. I will have a microphone, which will allow for your conversations and, or for your questions to be heard in the recording of this talk which we do plan to upload to our uh, Carter YouTube channel um, in the coming weeks. So please join me in welcoming Tessa Wetberg and Dr. Jessa Ray Growing Thunder. Hi. Oh. Are we on? Oh, we are we on. on. <laughs> um, what a gift to be up here with you and watch this on the big screen for the first time. I had never seen it on a big screen like me neither. this. neither. I was missing my mom and my grandma. Uh, I just seen my grandma. She was, came and spent five days with us again uh, in New Mexico. So mm -hmm. I literally just left her 48 hours ago, already oh, missing her I after see, that. I bet. Yeah. I bet. Yeah, I feel like the first thing, well, since in your bio they talked about kind of what you're doing right now, do you want to share like what you're working on um, creatively and kind of what you're doing professionally as well? Dr. Growing Thunder. <laughs> Um, still a little bit of imposter syndrome that <laughs> that always feels a little crazy to hear, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but it's important yeah. because, as I mentioned, I'm I'm the first Dr. Growing Thunder. I am Grandma's girl. I am the oldest of 24 grandkids, um, so it, it's important to acknowledge um, that I am the first, but I will not be the last. Um, I have plenty of younger uh, siblings and cousins who are currently in college and in those in-between places um, pursuing higher education, so it's really exciting. Um, I, I have a lot going on at any given moment. Uh, somebody's got to do the work, and, and I will do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am a Loose Indigenous Knowledge Fellow. I'm currently working on a project uh, centered on porcupine quill work. Um, and what happens when we use natural materials with this truly indigenous art form. Um, porcupine quill work is truly indigenous in the sense that it was long before um, colonization in a capacity we did quill work. That is our very first art form. Um, everything about it is immersed in your natural environment, how you navigate those natural environments, and how you connect with those natural environments. And so, you know, through the introduction of synthetic materials, shifts have occurred. And so how can we now, as contemporary quill workers, draw on those natural materials to rebalance and recenter ourselves? Um, it's been a really exciting process, a really heart, heartwarming process. Um, I am always consulting with museums, um, art centers, institutions, uh, regarding beadwork and quillwork histories, uh, processes, and perspectives. Uh, I was actually just at the Autry Museum of the American West out in LA 
I've been working with them for a little over a year now um, on a project that will open next year um, called Three Views. Um, really exciting work. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm constantly consulting, constantly helping institutions navigate uh, these spaces and these perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, always working, always writing, always, always writing. At any given moment, I have five different things going on. And at the same time, I'm still beating and quilling. You know, that this is, this is where my heart work. That's my happy place. You know, I can sit here and I can tell you what I do to make an income. Um, but the, at the end of the day, my happy place is sitting at the table, um, picking up my needle and thread and creating. That's mm -hmm. where everything's at. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I always have several different projects going. I have a few pieces that I'm getting ready to wrap up. Um, I'm thinking about the next year and, you know, this new process of, I still consider myself a new mom. My daughter is two and a half sitting in the very back row. Um, I'm always going to be a new mom. <laughs> <laughs> and so thinking about, you know, my upcoming projects and how I draw on what it means to be a mother with a little girl. Mm. Well, and seeing you all sitting at the table and her kind of starting to touch the materials, which I think you said you started doing at three years old. So has that relationship grown for her? You know, has she kind of gotten more, does she have a bead kit and does she have sort of her own little universe there? She does. Um, it's inherent. Yeah. She, you know, a lot of this process is never telling her no. I've been really firm that I don't ever, I don't yell at her, get after her if she goes over and picks up my needles and my thread or like my little beads, my micro beads that are just jewels. You know, I, I don't get upset. I don't tell her no. I encourage it. Um, you know, she has to learn that touch. And what that touch is, is it's almost like a delicate, you know, making sure that you're good to your material so that they'll be good to you. And, you know, them learning at this at this age is critical. Um, you know, there's something about them being this young and this innocent. You know, they're still in this place of being sacred. Um, you know, they're still connected to the ancestors and the spirits in a, way, a different way than we are. And so for them to learn these things at this point in their lives is special. And, you know, so she's, she's getting that touch. Mm -hmm. You know, she's, she's delicate with things. She knows to respect them. She even recognizes my, my family's beadwork. Wow. You know, she, she does this new thing where, um, you know, we have a certain color palette. We have certain designs, you know, that, that are definitely inherently things that pop out when we, we work. Mm -hmm. Nuna already identifies this. She can look at something and she, she could say, oh, unchi, unchi, it's pretty. Like she recognizes like, oh, her grandma did that. Wow. Um, so it's interesting. And she does, she has her own bead kit. She started with like these wooden beads first that were a little bit bigger. She had shoelaces. Um, now she has like a smaller bead kit where the beads are smaller. Um, my mom was just telling me a few days ago that for Christmas this year, she wants to introduce Nuna to her first needle. Mm -hmm. um, she wants to, her to string up popcorn and cranberries for Christmas. So that would be her first experience with a needle. Um, and, you know, it's exciting to watch this process as a mom. I bet. Yeah, and, and in the film, we actually get to witness the beginning of one of the pieces that is in this museum as we speak, which is extraordinary. Um, can you talk a little bit about the process of collaborating with your mom and grandmother on that piece specifically and, and how that, you know, who's working on what? How does that work when you kind of decide to make something together? Yeah, so I, enc I encourage you all to, to go upstairs after this and, and visit with Himashima. Um, he is a soft sculpture doll, um, and I didn't know he was the opener of the show. <laughs> it was a great surprise to come around the corner and to see him right away. Um, you know, we very much believe that these things have a life, um, and we always treat him as such, and we acknowledge him in that way. You know, so I texted my mom right away, and I said, Mom, he's here. He looks good. <laughs> um, you know, it's a really natural mm -hmm. process. To, to work with my, my mom and my grandma, you know, it's because we've always done this. I mean, this is how I learned. Um, you know, my mom and my grandma work this way every single day. You know, this process, what this looks like is at my mom and grandma's home, they have a very big table. 
like a very, very big work table. Um, and you could sit anywhere around this table, pull up a chair, and bead. Um, that's just been the, always the policy of this. You know, any grandkid can come up, pull up a chair, pick up a needle and thread, and grandma and mom will help you. Um, and so, you know, to collaborate with them on projects is always an exciting thing because it's such a natural process. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we always have, you know, it, we always have different areas of the project that we definitely inherently pick up because those are our strengths. But we also naturally help one another. You know, um, with Himashima, um, you'll see on his, his shirt and his leggings, uh, there's hair strips and porcupine quill work wrapped around the hair strips. Um, this was a new technique to me. Um, I had never done this technique of quill work before. But when we first started this, this project, my mom immediately said, she was like, I'm not going to do this. You know, this is normally her job. She said, I'm not going to do this. Interesting. You're going to do it. Because it's time that you, you really um, you strengthen that skill. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, those moments in which, like, we allow each other to grow and to, to continue to refine your skill. Because, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of artists in the room, and you all can agree with me. Like, it's, you're never done learning, right? You're never done learning. It's you're always refining your skills. You're always continuing to grow. And, you know, working with my mom and grandma on projects, it's, I'll never be done learning. Mm, yeah. That will never end for me. Which is so exciting for all of us to know there's a lot of work to come as well. Um, is there anything specific that you're all collaborating on currently? Or is there anything you want to share in that I would, I, I'm going to go ahead and talk because <laughs> mom and grandma aren't here to say shh. <laughs> um, so my mom and I are actually working on something really exciting um, that we've actually been working on and off for about four or five years at this point, just because, you know, at any given moment, we will have five, 10 projects going mm -hmm. Because what this process looks like is, I, I was really fortunate to grow up in a household of beaters and quill workers, and that certain traditions and protocols were always inherently around. Mm -hmm. And you know, some of those traditions and protocols say that every single time you pick up your needle and thread, you're creating a life form. Because you're giving a piece of yourself to this piece. Um, I see a lot of artists in the room shaking their head. Yeah, exactly. And, and so you don't, you don't ever sit down with your needle and thread if, if you're feeling off, you're having a bad day, you have any kind of negative energy or negative emotion, you step away. You don't ever fight with these things. You know, you, you only give good to it. You only mm -hmm. speak good to them. You only pray good. You only give the, that good prayers and those good thoughts and energies to it because you want it to live a good life. And so because of that, sometimes pro projects will, you know, there'll be a breeze. Mm -hmm. Himashima, he was effortless. He was effortless. And he, my mom talks about it all the time. You know, that's, that's rare to find something so effortless. There was no problem with him. There was never any hiccups with him. He just naturally flowed. Mm -hmm. But there's other times where, you know, a project will tell you, you know, it will tell you to take a step back. You know, maybe it doesn't like that color. Maybe it doesn't like what you're seeing. Maybe it wants you to see what it sees. And so because of that, you know, sometimes projects can take several years, you know, because you don't ever force it. You know, you let it do what it needs to do. And you trust and you have faith in that. And so my mom and I, we have this project that we've been working on for about four or five years now and it, it somewhat aligns with our soft sculpture dolls in the sense that it is miniature, um, but it is actually a horse. A lot of horse people. <laughs> we are horse people too. <laughs> and um, it's a horse. And he's, a, he's about this big. Um, and what we're doing with him is, 
It is just him. We're not putting any other person with him. It's just him. And we're dressing him. We have a very, very distinct tradition in our culture where uh, we dress our horses for our parades, right? We, we don them. You know, we will work all year round beating for those horses, you know, their masks, their, their bridles, uh, their saddle, you know, their saddle bags, everything. We will spend a year, possibly years, dressing that horse. We will take him through the parade, and then at the end of it, give everything away. We might even give that horse away. You know, it's never about us. It's, it's about everybody else. It's about that horse. That horse is a brother to us. He's, he's our brother, you know, and we honor him that way. You know, we treat him just as we would treat our daughter, our brother. And, and so we're drawing on this tradition and this responsibility of kinship and reciprocity mm-hmm. and honoring and respect. And um, we're trying to make a statement of that, you know, that, you know, we need to uphold these things. And so... We're working on him. Everything is miniaturized. As I said, he's yay big. He's gorgeous. We, <laughs> we, we got him to pose. You know? <laughs> we have him posing, and he's, he's fully dressed. So we're, we're thinking that, um, you know, we've, we've never rushed him, and we're thinking next year might be his year to mm-hmm. finally show. You know, he might be there if he allows us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's such an interesting part of the process, too, is, is sort of just trusting and never forcing anything. And, and I think being around you all, that was so clear. And your mom, as, as she said in the film, um, is a phenomenal researcher, is encyclopedic in her knowledge of pretty much everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, and she mentioned when, when you were a little girl, too, that there were Bodmer books around the house that that was part of kind of what informed some of the historical accuracy. Can you talk about that relationship for you to that, seeing that work as a young person? I was probably like the youngest person you'll ever meet that knew who Carl Bodmer was. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was darn proud of that. <laughs> um, when Annika and I first started having conversations about this show, I was like, oh yeah. Bodmer, of course. <laughs> he was always around my house. Um, you know, my my mom, you know, she, you know, my grandma, she had, she had a wealth of knowledge in her own right, and she still continues to do so in the sense that she learned firsthand from her grandmothers, who learned from their grandmothers and their grandmothers and their grandmothers. And my mom, you know, she took on this responsibility of, of, being the person that weaves in these other resources of, of how we connect to those unchis and those grandmas seven generations back. You know, how do we make sure our beadwork and our quill work and our projects reflect their work? Because that's important. You know, yes, we're contemporary women, we're contemporary artists, but we're also traditional artists. And there's a responsibility with that in making sure that we are accurate and that we're upholding the work that they had done, mm-hmm. you know, in the 1800s. And so a lot of that, you know, unfortunately, you know, does get lost. Um, you know, the thing with Assiniboine, Nakoda beadwork and quill work, is you hardly ever find it in museum collections or private collections. A lot of it doesn't exist anymore because um, Assiniboine peoples endure three different smallpox. Um, and this doesn't get said a lot. This doesn't get said enough that what happens when you endure a smallpox epidemic is a lot of the times they're burning the bodies and everything that that person had. They're burning it because they didn't know how to stop spread. And so when you get a population and a people that have endured three smallpox epidemics, I mean, we were the largest community in North America in the Northern Plains. Like, we, we were vast. And now we are, our communities are much smaller. Um, so not only are we losing a generations of firsthand knowledge, but we're losing physical material. But then you get things like Carl Bodmer's work that give us a visual representation. You know, because we can find these little snippets mm. 
in private collections, museum collections, you know, those small little remnants that we can get through the oral histories and the community members that still practice. We have these small snippets, but when you can get Carl Bodmer, who by all means snipped a moment from that time and showed you exactly what all of those details look like on one person when they're all together, that's an incredible resource. And so my mom, she, she knew this. She understood this very early on in her career. Yeah. Um, my mom's library is something dreams are made of. Um, and so, you know, I grew up with, like, books open, you know, just all over the tables, all over the counters, books just open to different Carl Bodmer portraits, you know, so that she could point to any one of them and piece together what this looks like. It's phenomenal. Mm. That's a wealth of knowledge right there. And we're fortunate to have that. Absolutely. And does it feel like, um, you know, interacting with the work and, and when you get to be with it in space, um, whether it is a private collection or a museum, um, do you have a memory of the first time you got to kind of interact with, with pieces you hadn't seen before or with, with the work in kind of a more structured space? Um, I am always blown away. <laughs> I spend a lot of time in, in collections. I spend a lot of time with private collectors. I spend a lot of I, I devote every single extra waking moment that I have to make sure to spend time with these historical pieces because it's critical. It's mm -hmm. important. You know, you can't understand a contemporary art form without understanding where it came from. Um, and the only way to do that is to spend the time with them. Um, and I'm always blown away. I'll never stop being blown away. Um, you know, there's something amazing about just the effortless, like the symmetry, the color palettes. Mm. You know, our women, you can go back to 1800, you can go back to 1830, you can even go to early reservation period, early 1900s. Any given moment, you can look at an, a piece of old beadwork and quillwork, and these women understand color theory just in this amazing way. Little things, like they understand to not place dark against dark, right? Because if you are gonna bead something for somebody to wear, like a shirt, you wanna be able to stand 20 feet away, 50 feet away, and look at that man from afar and say, wow, Somebody loves him. Mm. Somebody loves him enough to make him that. And it is striking. It caught my eye this far away. And the only way to do that is your color theory, right? To place that light color against that dark color to make it pop. If you place a green next to a blue, you're not going to get that effect. But if you place a white or a yellow next to that blue, oh. <laughs> And these women knew that. Mm. These women knew that. They knew symmetry. They knew how to balance geometrics, florals, pictorials. They knew how to balance, you know, empty space against non-empty space. Yeah. How to use empty space to create their own designs. Like, it just blows my mind. Mm. Every single time I'm, I'm, I'm with pieces, like, there's something new that just, like, and I, I love, I love contemporary bead workers and quilt workers, and I love spending time and space and visiting with other other people. But I always have to remind people, like we gotta humble ourselves. We think we're innovative. No, it's been done before. It's all been done. <laughs> like we gotta humble ourselves. Um, our ideas are nothing new. Um, our ideas have probably just slept a generation or two. Mm. But when they reappear, they're nothing new. Well, and that embodied um, experience, I mean, watching your grandmother work, there were so many times where she wouldn't look down at all. Like, it is such a somatic embodied experience. And the, everyone that day talked a lot about how women are the historians, whether the, where the oral, oral tradition was sort of happening in the traditional sense, but it's in the work. Um, so within the portraits themselves, you know, there's so much of that history in the clothing and in those details, but what, is there anything missing? You know, what stories are being told and what stories do you feel like aren't being told in the portraits? 
I would say that it's not just within the portraits, but mm -hmm. in, in many conversations and in many acknowledgments, what's, what's often missing is that the acknowledgement that it's women. Yeah. You know, it's, it's always the women that are silently in the background doing this hard work, carrying on those responsibilities in ways and capacities in which many of us will never understand and never comprehend, they have continued to hold on to our culture in ways that we often forget. Um, so, you know, you can go upstairs and you can look at all of those beautiful portraits and you'll look at them and you'll be, like, astounded at the beauty behind it. But always remember at the other end of that it was they were women, you know, sitting, you know, not only creating these beautiful master works of art um, out of love, pure love for the person that would wear them and use them and utilize them every single day. That's love. So not only are they doing that, our women are moving the camps. They are putting up the teepees by themselves. I've tried that. That's, that's a three-man job. <laughs> they're cooking. They're taking care of the kids. They're tanning the heights. Um, you know, they're doing everything. That always, like, <laughs> astounds me. Um, you know, the simple thing of, you know, a newborn child even. In our culture, when a woman is expecting a child, she's not allowed to prepare. She's not allowed to prepare. Um, you know, we have sacred traditions that you know acknowledges that that baby is sacred and it comes from the ancestors and so you know we're not allowed to prepare because we do not own that child until that child comes earthside um, and we give birth and so a woman is not allowed to prepare can you imagine that i did that it's not easy <laughs> <clears throat> but then you see fully beaded cradle boards mm -hmm you see fully beaded buckskin dresses, all of the toys, all of the clothes, all of this. That came after the child. That amazes me. That is love on top of everything else she was doing. She had the time to make a fully beaded cradle board. Mine took six months. <laughs> it is pretty extraordinary to sort of think about like you, you said, you're from three generations of women, but you're from, you know, seven beyond. Um, and the experience of, of sitting and working with your family, is there a, um, you know, is there a dream that you have for sort of Nuna and, and her and this next generation? Like, just being upstairs with the doll, I was thinking about, um, you know, what it means to have these future generations, like what you're creating and how that's going to inform and inspire and sort of the history that the pieces you're making are holding. How does it feel to sort of engage with those future generations and how they're going to sort of move with your work? You know, my mom always, I mean, I, I, like I said, I was six years old when my mom explained this responsibility to yeah. me. And, you know, that's how we always carry ourselves, is that these, these things are never for us. Um, we're fortunate that we can make a living doing this. We're very fortunate because even if we couldn't, we would still be doing this because it's a responsibility. And we do it so that the future generations have it. That is the whole purpose. You know, we're doing it to guarantee that Nuna's grandbabies have this. And, but this amazing thing had happened when I did become a mother, mm -hmm. and that that responsibility, it's not necessarily that it felt heavier, but it felt more clear. It gave, it gave me root to understand what that really means. Um, and in all honesty, that's why I'm doing my, my quill work project right now, mm -hmm. of you know, really emphasizing the natural materials because I want her to know what that means and to rely on only natural materials and to understand like you use your best smoked moose hide to make your moccasins um, because it's going to marry your quills better. Um, 
you know, I want her to know those things and to have that knowledge. Mm -hmm. So it's this different process of, of learning for me and making sure that I truly understand why things are the way they are. Mm -hmm. You know, my mom always encourages me to ask questions. And now that I'm a mom, I, I, I wish I had asked more. <laughs> <laughs> I always just accepted it, but now I wish I had more. Like, well, why? 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 So it's, it's a, an interesting shift, but it's, it's a beautiful shift to witness that. And, you know, I know that Nuna is the type of personality where she's going to ask me why, and I need to figure out the question <laughs> or the answer before she has the question now. Um, so it's, yeah. it's great. Mm. Well, and you talked a little bit about the sort of oral history project you were doing with your grandmother, and that at some point you sort of realized that it was in the work. Like, did you end up continuing and completing that, or did that kind of just become that realization? That's always evolving. Okay. Um, I mean, my dissertation was that. Yes. In the sense that, like, this is a conversation, but it's the beginning of this conversation. And ever since, you know, I, I had this epiphany um, that really wasn't an epiphany because it's more like, well, yeah, of course. Of course I knew that. Of course we all knew that. Yeah. Um, but ever since that, that aha moment, it's give me an opportunity and I, I'm going to make sure we all know this in the room and that we continue the conversations that we all every single person needs to have in order to strengthen these understandings. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's continuing to evolve. It's continuing to take new light. I'm always writing about this. I'm always documenting. Um, I'm always looking for ways to incorporate this knowledge and this perspective in everything that I do, which is why I love working with museums um, because museums have the capacity to take that and make it institutional knowledge. Um, and that's amazing. You know, I, I love to have these conversations with the institutions. I love to have these conversations in community. Um, and so to find ways in which we can overlap that is beautiful because I look out on you all and this is a community right here. And I hope you all walk out of here tonight and recognize like, yeah, women are historians. Mm -hmm. Women are doing it, y'all. They always have. <laughs> Well, and when I think about, you know, sort of your art form inside of this other art form um, of, of filmmaking and how, like, what did it mean to kind of collaborate just collectively with all of us, but with your, with your mom and grandmother in this space, like, was that a new experience? How did it feel to kind of share in that space? And, you know, ultimately, what does it mean to you all to have this sort of living document? You and John made it easy. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I told you all this early on yeah. that this, I can't even tell you what this means to me to have this, this documented because I will sit there and I will see this every single day. I will see what happens when we all sit at a table and I will see the process of noon and learning. But we always want to share that. You know, how could, I could sit here and I could tell you, but when you can physically see that, when you can see the great grandma, the grandma, the daughter, and the granddaughter all sitting at the table together, that's different. You know, so when I, you all first approached and we started having these Zoom conversations about this, like I, I came at you and I was like, <laughs> we, need a, we need footage of, of Unchi's hands, yeah. we need to get footage of her yeah. hands the tiny bead she works with. And, you know, this was something that I wanted and that I yearned for. And, you know, you all made it so easy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was this kind of like natural process that took place, which is as a Native woman and as a Native artist, like yeah. that's all you can ever hope for is to come across people that want to collaborate with you and, and find something that's going to be mutually beneficial. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we got here. And I thank you for that so much. I mean, this is beautiful. Um, and there's so much like other footage that came from it that you gave to us. Yes. And, you know, that, and you know, this other thing that happened too is I'm sitting here listening to your bio 
And I'm like, she's a storyteller. <laughs> like, that's what she is. She's a storyteller. You know, she's an artist. She's a storyteller. And, you know, we're storytellers as well. And I think that when you all first came in the house, we felt that on each other. Mm. And, you know, it was... <laughs> My grandma's a very shy woman. Um, she, she is not ever the person who would be up on the stage. <laughs> she is a very humble woman. Um, she, she won't ever take the spotlight. Um, and so, you know, there, there was the little uh, apprehension of like, okay, we're going to put a camera in front of you. What are you going to do? Um, but the crew and, you know, you, John and Annika, you guys came the night before. You know, we sat around and we visited, we mm. ate, uh, we laughed, and that was it. She was hooked. <laughs> She's hilarious. <too. laughs> she, she, it, <laughs> that was it. She, you, you guys made her comfortable. Mm. And so, you know, the next morning when they showed up at, what time did you guys get there? Four? It was early. Yeah. <laughs> it was, it was dark. <laughs> for sure. But they'd been up for hours. Yeah. I don't understand like what time they go to bed. Because <laughs> they were up at three, they said that morning. <laughs> Just add it right away. It's the first thing. Like you said, she said she would have missed her beads if she would have gotten up two hours later. Yeah. 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 Like it's, it's so physical. Yeah. Yeah. So it was all natural. Like she, yeah. they walked in and grandma, oh, good morning. <laughs> and like, it didn't matter that there was cameras yeah. and there were lights. Like it, it was fine. It was natural. And that's mm -hmm. all you can ever hope for. Yeah. Um, you know, and it, to find somebody to, to find you and John and Annika that, you know, you, you wanted to help tell our story. Um, you know, and that's important, not just, for us, you know, as our family, but, you know, as a way to connect with all of you, you know, that's, that's what we want, is we want to be able to share our story. And this is one way in which we were able to do that. Mm. Well, and I think we had talked recently, too, about, you know, what is the use beyond the muse museum walls for these pieces? Like, do they, are they going to live other places? Can they be tools in, in, educational settings like have you heard anything of of their use outside of museum spaces i um so i'm also an educator i've taught in different institutions so i've used this video as a teaching resource i've used it in my classrooms uh, to emphasize art to emphasize culture to emphasize history i have used it as a way to emphasize resources you know what happens when we merge modern technologies with indigenous knowledge systems but I've also had plenty of my peers across different institutions use it as a resource as well. This film is being used in, in classrooms all the time. I literally just did a guest lecture via Zoom um, a few days ago for Chico State University out in California. And um, they had this video as homework leading up to my guest lecture. Um, how cool is that though? <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> I love this as homework. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think, you know, as we talk more about sort of how you all hold these different histories in the work, in the sort of experience of, of making the work and doing everything that you do, like, I think all art sort of is, is the beginning of a conversation, is asking questions, is, and do you feel like the, the work you're doing right now um, is asking certain questions that, are, that feel, you know, because even when you were talking about becoming a mother, like your color palette changed, like you're, we're, we're always learning, growing, evolving. Um, do you feel like, are there new questions emerging for you in the work? You know, I really love this question because right where, where I'm at with my process and where I think my mom is at, on a different area of the spectrum okay. is how, how do we define ourselves as contemporary women doing traditional art? Mm. Because there's a far, very fine spectrum of staying traditional and being very methodical about how we present 
our traditional arts in the sense of being really true, 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 true traditional artists mm -hmm. versus acknowledging that our people have always adapted. We've never been stagnant, not geographically, um, not artistically. Every single time there was a new resource, a new technique, a new material, heck yeah, we were all about that. <laughs> tell you right now if my own cheese from the 1800s saw what we have now as far as like lights mm -hmm. um microscopes uh you know dyes needles um like they would be so enthusiastic um it was never about being static it was always about adapting so on the one end of the spectrum you have being true truly truly indigenous and really grounding yourself in that. On the other end of that spectrum, you have, well, we have always adapted. I can still be a traditional artist while being contemporary as well. And so it's an interesting moment for my family because this strange thing has happened with me and my mom mm. where I have always kind of been more over here where like I have gotten a little bit more creative with my art. You know, I've gotten a little bit more, I, I want to say something with it. I've done very political pieces. I've done very outrageous pieces. And I have always proclaimed that they are traditional. Um, and my mom has always been like, nope, this is the way things are done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, no one has ever told me otherwise. You know, they've always really supported that. But, you know, we've always been on opposite ends of the spectrum. You know, we would always meet in the middle whenever we work together. But when it was our own solo projects, we were always kind of like this. But now the strange thing has happened mm. where my mom and myself are really like, it's really strange, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> it's really strange. <clears throat> my mom is like doing really neat stuff with like her backgrounds. Like she will make like, you know, this phenomenal horse collar with like very traditional quill work at the center. But then she will bead a background which you never beat a background for a quilt piece uh -huh. um and she like creates movement and abstract designs in the background um and it's like you know my grandma looked at it when my mom was working on it and she was like whoa <laughs> <laughs> like, she didn't know what to think because uh -huh. you know my mom my mom doesn't do that uh -huh. um and then me i'm over here like you know, researching, you know, pipe bags from 1890. <laughs> and I'm, I'm like emphasizing, no, this is it. We are going to be truly traditional. We are going to use only the finest hide for this. Um, it has got to be this measurement exactly. This is a truly traditional piece. Um, so like there, me and my mom are on opposite sides of the spectrum right now. And it's this really kind yeah. of like neat question of like, how do we define ourselves mm. as traditional artists, as contemporary women? Or do we acknowledge that we are always adapting and that we have every right to be at any given point on that spectrum? Wow. Um, and that we can maneuver back and forth. So it's this interesting, interesting thing. Does she know what's informing kind of her creativity within these newer pieces like is it a specific story she's i've tried talking to her about it because i started to see this like kind of like slow breakaway and i i've tried like asking her about it like mm -hmm. what's going on here yeah like you're you're really getting you're getting creative um you're getting really innovative you're mm -hmm. thinking outside the box and my mom you know she there was one point where she said you know maybe i found my voice Oh, wow. Which is a profound thing to say as an artist, right? That's like a profound, pivotal moment for an artist. I don't know. Like my, I thought I've seen my mom's masterpieces, wow. but maybe they're still coming. Like maybe like she's going to have ma like these masterpieces that like everything else before it is like nothing compared to what she's going to create. I'm my mom's biggest fan, in case you can't <laughs> um, my, my mom is, like, amazing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, where does, yeah, where does your grandmother fall in this sort of spectrum of... My grandma is very traditional. 
my grandma is very, very traditional. She has never like discouraged anybody from like exploring colors, exploring techniques and methods. She never discourages it, but she is firmly rooted in that she is a very traditional bead worker and quilt worker. She is very traditional. But, but she supports you all exploring. Yeah. Themes. Well, like, you know, what this, this pipe bag from the 1890s, you know, I, I made my own and um, I, I made it this year and I was really doubtful, doubtful about it, y'all, because it was a very traditional piece for me. And I was a little hesitant to show her. I'm always hesitant to show her. Is that Nuna? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, but... The very first thing she said when I showed it to her, I brought it out and I handed it to her, and she said, you did it right. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I ever oh, you, hoped no. to hear. <laughs> yes. Hi, Nuna. Hi, Nuna. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's fascinating because I... I'm kind of surprised to hear you say that you have that sort of trepidation with showing her. Cause oh, I'm terrified. That's so fascinating. Yeah, if I can help, if I'm working on something solo, yeah. I don't show them until it's done. Because I'm like, what are you going to say? It's done. <laughs> They've yes. never said anything bad about my work. They've never discouraged it. But I just like, I don't know. Like, I, yeah. it's... I, I always want to make sure that like I, I impress them, mm, you know? Yeah. Like, I want to make sure that like I'm living up to, to them. Mm. And Oof. that's that's a heavy burden. That's it's not a burden. It's no, burden, but, but they're just such phenomenal. Okay. Um, oh shoot! I feel like I have so many more, and I'm we're gonna wind <laughs> up a bit. But um, yeah, like when when I know seeing you collaborate in person is one thing, and you talk a lot about how you sort of do work apart here and there. Um, like when you're working. You know, it, regardless of if you're physically together or not, uh, it seems like you're so deeply connected to each other. Like, um, what is that experience? Like, if you're, so if you do decide to do something that's just all yours, like, does that, like, what does that come from within you? Like, you have, like, a certain sort of impetus for a specific piece that's all yours, or is it always a conversation with the group? I think it really varies. There's definitely a piece. I mean, me and my mom and grandma, we talk on the phone. I'm not going to lie. Um, this is probably embarrassing, but I talk to them probably about four or five times every single day. <laughs> um, very, very close. Uh, so, I mean, we're constantly on the phone, yeah. constantly talking, ta constantly in conversation. Um, and I'm not kidding. <laughs> my mom is my best friend. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I... I cannot show her what I'm working on, but I can have a conversation with her. Um, and, you know, every single medium of art has this, where, like, you basically have a language mm -hmm. that other people in your medium understand, right? And so my mom always calls it beater talk, that we could sit there and we can have this entire conversation and beater talk, and anybody else around us will look at us like, what the heck are these people <laughs> talking about? But we can have this conversation about beater talk and, you know, I cannot show her a piece and I can explain, you know, if I'm, if I'm thinking through something, if I'm thinking through my colors or I'm thinking through my construction, yeah. um, I can not show her and I can explain it to her and she'll like, oh yeah, well, what, have you tried this? Mm -hmm. You know, or I don't know, yeah. you know, have you thought, have you thought about it? Why don't you sit on it? Um, you know, we can have those conversations. And then I have other times where like, I won't even tell her what I'm working on. <laughs> Yeah. And then I'll pop up with something, and she'll be like, "Why'd you do that?" Like, ah, mom. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the you talked before about loving to engage with institutions and yeah. sort of sort of creating this knowledge base. At what point in the process did your grandmother start sort of sharing work in museum spaces? Like, when did that become part of the practice for your family? Oh, we need a whole another two hours <laughs> for that conversation. Um, my grandma's awesome. Um, yeah. My grandma was. In, in many ways, and, and many, many scholars and historians will argue that my grandma was the first contemporary beadwork and cloak artist to enter the space. Wow. Um, in the sense that, you know, at the, at the time, you know, in the 1970s, um, in the 1980s, 
you know, beadwork and quill work is still very much considered a historic art form. Um, it wasn't engaged with as, you know, contemporary people still practice this. Um, and this, this conversations and this, this work does belong in institutional spaces. Um, my grandma helped break down some of those barriers. Mm -hmm. um, she was the very first contemporary beat worker and quill worker to win Best of Show at Santa Fe Indian Market in 1985, which was a huge deal. Um, and she went on to win two other times. She holds the, the record for winning Best of Show. Um, she's, she's helped break down some of those barriers. So, I mean, really... She was beating long before that. Yeah. Everything just went to family. Everything yeah. went to friends. Um, but I think it was the 80s when she first started really emerging into this field in this area. Um, yeah, and it's been a wild ride. Oh, my gosh. Well, I think that you're going to take some questions from the audience. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? We have a few minutes. Oh, great. Okay, I'll go to you first. Hello, I'm very interested in the quill work. Is this thing on? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And how do you fix, how do you get the quills ready to use, and how do you fasten them to the leather or whatever you're putting them on? This is a great question. <laughs> um, so, Traditionally, um, you know, the process of even getting quills off of the porcupine, we never killed the porcupine. You know, why, why take the life of an animal when they can go and create more quills for you? Um, it was about respecting him. Um, whenever I talk about porcupines, I always refer to him. I don't know why. Um, I, I, I don't know where that comes from. But so traditionally, how would this look like is the women would get together. Only certain women had the responsibilities and the, the roles to be quill workers. This was a gift given to you um, by the spirits. It was never just anybody could pick it up and do it. It had to be given. And so uh, the women that were quill workers would kind of find their porcupine, figure out where he was at, and then they would come up with their plan. It was usually... You know, on the northern plains, we only had trees down by the creeks. Um, and so usually what this would look like is there would be women down by the creek hiding in the trees with their blanket or their hide, and they'd be waiting. And the other girls would come chasing that porcupine. They'd chase him down there. The other ones would jump out of the tree, throw that blanket, that hide over him, and then they'd take sticks and they'd kind of poke him. Because the, the porcupine doesn't shoot its quills. It just releases them. And so when you kind of poke it with a stick and tease it a little bit, he'll release his quills out of defense. And so after some time, you, you take the hide off, and he runs off. He's angry at the moment, but he'll get over it. You know? <laughs> he runs off, and then you have all these quills. And so it's a long process before you can even start quilling. You know, that takes time. And then you wash and you wash and you wash to make sure that everything is off of those quills. Then you go and you harvest your natural dyes, berries, roots. Um, this is a very intricate science that I am learning just now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but you have your natural dyes. Then you process the quills, which is a very intense process because you have to get the color without oversaturating the quill because quills are, um, what's the word I'm looking at? Mm. I'm draining. Uh, is it keratin? Car no, is it ke keratin, I think. Like what your hair is made out of? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so it's not like dyeing with a cotton or linen. You know, you, you have to be mindful that not every dye is going to take in a very specific manner. And so it's an exact science, science to get the color that you need um, without oversaturating the quill because it will get, like, if you over soak it, um, the quill will start to break down, right? Um, it's almost like you, you ruin the quill. Um, so when your quills are all ready, you sort them by different sizes. The prizes are right here along the belly. Um, that's where they're the prize possessions right there. Um, 
And then, so you sort them all out, you cut each tip off, so both ends of the tips, you soak them in your mouth, and it's a process of learning the touch, knowing when that quill is ready versus when it's too soft or not soft enough because it has to be pliable. You have to be able to bend it without making it stiff, without breaking it, because quills can be delicate, but they can also be stronger than beadwork. Mm. Um, so it's a very long process. And the, I mean, there's, there's dozens of techniques <laughs> of how to do quill work. You know, sometimes it's directly on the buckskin. Sometimes it's wrapped around things, like upstairs on Hishmashma. You'll see, like, I wrapped the porcupine quills around the hair. That's it. They are... You tuck them under, and you let those quills secure each other because the quills have these little tiny of hairs, these little <laughs> barbs that go in a certain direction. And so those quills can grab. I heard a lot mm. of, oh. <laughs> you, you can, it depends on your technique. Some techniques require thread, some don't. The technique up there where I wrapped it around the hair, no thread. It is all quill holding itself together. Mm. Are you an artist? No, but I bought a quill bracelet. I'm just curious if you have to put it together. <laughs> there you go. She is an artist. She's a weaver. I was going to say, like, uh, you, you know, you were following me. Like, you knew exactly what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> is there another question? Yes, uh, congratulations for your work. And I was just curious, you know, all of this is about women, right? Your grandma, your mother, you, your daughter. So where are, they, where are, men, where are men? Where are the men? I mean, what, what do they do? How do they uh, in, get involved in this, um, you know, the, keeping the traditions or do mm -hmm. they get engaged or do they... Where are they? I mean, yeah. in, the, in this story, right? No, that's a great question. Okay. No, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we had different roles and responsibilities that were very gendered. Um, you know, beadwork, quill work was a woman's responsibility. Um, occasionally, men were selected for this process, but there's certain poli like uh, practices and protocols that go with what would happen if a man was given this gift of beadwork and quill work. Um, and how he, because when you're given the gift to create beadwork and quill work, you have to live your life a certain way. And so how you live your life looks differently if you're a man selected for this process and this tradition. Um, our men carry different traditions. Our men were our warriors. Um, you know, my, my husband who just took my daughter outside, that's where the men are at. <laughs> um, he, he's a combat veteran of 11 years, Marine Corps. Uh, happy birthday, Marines. Um, and so, you know, our men were our warriors. Our men were the ones taking care of Shunko and Khan. They were the ones taking care of the horses. Our men, um, you know, they, they held different responsibilities. They were the ones that carried the songs, took care of the drum. Um, you know, they, they had their own things. We had ours. There was a mutual respect in our encampments. Um, you know, but things have changed. Things have adapted. You know, we have plenty of men that know how to bead and quill. We have plenty of women that are warriors now. We have plenty of women that, you know, are the ones caring for the horses. You know, a lot of these shifts have happened um, just because of the needs of the community. Um, but don't worry. We, we have them working hard. These men are busy. <laughs> mm -hmm. We have time for another question if anyone has one. Can you repeat the question so we can hear it on the recording? Yeah, Thanks. yeah. So um, ex a question asking to explain the use of the dolls, um, where they come from. Um, and so this art form um, that you'll see upstairs with, uh, with Himashima, this actually is a contemporary example of, of what we call dolls. Um, I mean, historically, we did have dolls. Dolls were used as a way to teach young girls um, how to dress themselves, how to play, how to care for family. They taught them, you know, values like honor, 
um, you know, how to treat your, your family. You know, you can look at historic dolls and they have like all of their tools on them. There's boy dolls, girl dolls, baby dolls. Um, so, I mean, historically, we had always had dolls. Dolls were a great tool used by uh, children. And so this amazing thing had happened, you know, forgive me for not knowing the year, but I believe it was in the 80s where you had certain native bead workers and quill workers, all women, um, not to say that there aren't men doll makers out there, but during this point in the 80s, you had people like my grandmother and Charlene Holy Bear, who are traditional artists, who started to experiment with this art form of dolls. Um, so my grandma's dolls from the 80s up until, you know, the early 2000s, they're very much dolls. You know, they, you can take them off their stand and you can hold them, you can play with them. But, you know, we're always evolving. And so now they've kind of taken this form of they're more like soft sculpture. You know, you, they're not necessarily so, you know, doll-like where you can take them out and play with them and they flop around. But rather now they have wire armatures underneath them. You can pose them. And they've kind of taken this different avenue of what they are and what they're used for. For me, as a young person, I always say I'm a young person. One of these days, somebody's going to call me on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, for me, as a younger person, learning, dolls are a learning resource. You know, when I can work with my mom and my grandma and a doll, what they're doing is they're showing me how we dress from that particular time period. Um, you know, the, the doll upstairs, the soft sculpture, I mean, that was a learning process for me because I was learning from the Bodmer era, how we would dress during the specific era, what that looks like in physical form. Um, and so now do dolls are very detailed. They're all done in micro beads, you know, to get every single little detail in there so that if you were just to take this miniature version and expand it and get that full-size attire and regalia in front of you, it's an exact replica. Um, so that hopefully that explains it a little bit. It's a small field. It is not a whole lot of people that are out there making these, these particular pieces. Uh, there's a great show at the Herd Museum in Phoenix called Grand Procession. Um, they, it's all on dolls. Mm -hmm. It's so cool to see like a room of these like small figures um, who carry such presence. Um, and you know, I love I love working on dolls. I, and my mom always says, "Don't call them dolls; it confuses people." Um, <laughs> that's where they come from. Okay, we have time for one more question. Do you? Oh, okay. Anybody else? Are you sure? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you, Jessa Ray. Thank you, Tessa and Spencer as well. Um, you all have about half an hour left, so please go up and see the exhibition and see Jessa Ray's work. <laughs> thank you all. <laughs>